self-compassion was something that was so foreign to me because I was a quite a high achiever. Like I would, had a corporate job. I studied at a, a good university. I'd done well. I'd always had that desire. But then you get to a point where you've been flogging yourself internally with that dialogue that has actually got you to where you are and who you perceive yourself to be. Hi. Welcome to Our Power is Within podcast. I'm your host, Jasmine, and my mission has always been to inspire you to take your power back and realize that healing is possible in mind and body and in soul. Wow, it has been a while, right? (laughs) And yet here we are. I had this episode recorded, this interview recorded so many months ago, and I wanted to make sure that I still got it out to you all so that you could enjoy it. And before I introduce you to our guest today, I did want to just say hi and give a little personal check-in and also check in on all of you. So how are you? What's good? What's new? What have been the biggest thing that you have learned this year? What's been your biggest challenge? What have you been feeling most excited about? If you feel up to sharing any of this with me, send me a DM or email me and fill me in because I just love hearing from anyone who wants to connect. So me, I know I gave y'all a little update on the last episode months ago, so I thought I would just give you a new little update. I would say that overall life has been really good. I have been continuing to just really explore what truly brings me joy and what feels good and juicy in my sacral center. So not what I think should bring me joy based on past experiences or what society and culture says brings joy or even what used to bring me joy, but what actually truly brings me joy in the now. I'm learning how often I think I should be doing some big thing to feel this genuine contentment. And yet it is usually in the most simplistic little things where I feel most fulfilled and in a state of flow, where my sacral center lights up and I know that I am in the correct direction for me. Whew, it is a journey. It's a long journey. It's crazy how often my mind can trick me again and again and yet again. (laughs) I've had some really big epiphanies and I've gotten a lot of clarity around some big areas in my life that I still have a ton of opportunity for deep healing. It started back in June when I had some really fun travel plans that I was incredibly excited about up until the week that I was preparing to go. This trip really showed me how much fear is still playing in the background of my life and how much the fear is actually present around things I didn't even realize I was actually afraid of. And this, in return, brought me a high level of anxiety through my whole trip, which also led to a load of physical discomfort and exhaustion. However, it also allowed me the opportunity to practice surrendering to what is and being with it all and accepting that the trip would be whatever it was, which in the end, it was still incredible. In almost divine timing, though, I came home from this trip and I had a wonderful chat with a good friend. Some of um, you might know him, Carden Rabin, the co-founder of Somia International and the co-author of his new book, The Secret Language of the Body. It was some really good wisdom on how to approach this fear and move through it, or better yet, let it move through me, but basically to not let it have control anymore. And in the end, I was able to see how this trip and this overwhelming fear that showed up was actually a gift because it was insights into the opportunities that I still had for healing. And this experience lit a fire in my belly like nothing has really ever lit a fire in my belly before. And it became a huge catalyst for me to take big action in my life. Accepting that for once 
and for all. I am the creator of my life. I get to play a big, juicy role in creating my life in a way I desire. So part of this, as I mentioned at the beginning, is figuring out what I desire. What is juicy? What would be the most ideal life? What would my most perfect day look like? And I've decided that the best way for me to figure this out is to simply try things on and see what feels really good and then include and do more of that. And then whatever feels icky, see if I can just let it go. If I can't let it go, I can ask myself why. Where's the need to hold on to it coming from? What story am I still holding on to that says I can't let this go? So here we are. It's September. The fear is not completely gone, but I believe fully that it doesn't have the handle on me that it did back in June. I have some loose practices that I engage in regularly and tools that I use as needed. And every day I wake up and I try to imagine what would be the best version of this day that I could live so that when I go to sleep tonight, I can look back on my day with a big smile on my face and gratitude in my heart, feeling so fulfilled. I am learning so much about myself along the way, and it's crazy (laughs) that no matter how long we do this journey called life and healing and growth, there is always more to learn. I am doing things that I want to because I choose it. I am seeing how many ways my mind can trick me and mislead me or try to keep me stuck. And sometimes I am stuck in it. And when I step out of it finally and back into the witness mode, I can literally laugh because this it's just so intriguing to me. It's just crazy to witness how my mind can take me on this roller coaster ride. So shall I say life has been quite an adventure. And I'm having fun with it. I have some exciting fall plans on the horizon. I'm going on a road trip to visit family for a couple of weeks. And my soul cannot wait to connect with people who I care so deeply for and to create new memories. I am excited for shifts in the weather and for this new season of life. I've had some other big thoughts that I've been wanting to share with you all a lot around why I have felt such a strong need to really step out of the podcast, particularly doing interviews, but yeah, just in general. However, I do not feel like I've fully synthesized these thoughts in a way that I feel ready to share them. So Highly likely that there will be a solo episode, eh, solo episode coming soon once I get those thoughts clear in my mind. Anyhow, I'm rambling. I love you all. And I hope that every person listening to this is thriving in some way, that your life is better today than it was one year ago, and that it will be even significantly better one year from now. I do really love hearing from you all. So If you do feel compelled, please drop me a line and fill me in and be well. Be well in mind, in body, and in soul. And thank you so much for listening to my ramble, if you even made it this far. (laughs) Anyhow, our guest today is awesome. And he has a pretty fun story with some epiphanies in his journey that he shares with us. His name is Harry McCanch. He is a chronic pain educator. If you stick around until the end, he will guide us through a fun little practice that I really enjoyed very much. And please enjoy. Harry, thank you so much for being here with me today. Thanks, Jasmine. Yeah, really excited to be here and add some value to your listeners through our conversation. Obviously, um, provide that that little guided exercise at the end and some free free resources as well. So yeah, excited for it. Yeah, yeah. For everyone who's listening, what he just said, stay until the end. Make sure that you stay until the end because he's going to guide us through a little process that has to do with everything we're going to talk about today and it'll be fun. And like he said, he's going to have free resources so you can follow him on Instagram and get those free resources if you DM him. Yay. (laughs) All right, Harry. So what we're going to do to start, I think, is to introduce you to the audience. I'm going to 
give the floor to you to talk a little bit about who you are and what you've recovered from and just your personal path and journey that has led you to where you are today. Sure. So currently these days, I'm a public speaker, wellness advocate, and also a wellness coach. And I suppose all of that eventuated through my own lived experience over the last six years. So I'll dive back through where that all started. And it was back in 2017 when I got an ankle injury. And that was just meant to be like a six-week return to sport. Not a big deal. And basically started getting this tingling and burning in my left ankle that spread up that leg and was getting these temperature changes, color changes that developed into severe neurological pain. And it took me a number of months to get a diagnosis on that, by which time it had spread to the other leg and started spreading up that leg as well. And by that time, I thought I was going crazy. I got a diagnosis of something called complex regional pain syndrome. And it's quite a rare condition. I think it's about six in 100,000 people typically is the rate. And for those of you who haven't heard about it, it's largely considered the most painful condition known to humans. And that was one thing that I discovered about it. The second part about it is that when you Google it, it tells you that it's incurable. So those two things combined makes it quite a heinous condition to live with. And I think. It's often referred to as suicide disease because the component of the hopelessness of not being able to actually find a resolution and also the intensity of the pain creates this yeah, intense state of suffering. So I lived in that for a number of years and trying to find a resolution through medication and different treatments that really didn't offer any resolution, nerve blocks, spinal cord stimulators, the traditional medical models approach to just blocking and trying to numb the sensations. So that really led me to nowhere. And I think it wasn't until I found this news article one day and I got sent it and it was about this clinic in the Midwest of America that was treating my condition and also a bunch of other central nervous system conditions like EDS, POTS, fibromyalgia, and obviously CRPS as well with really, really high success rates up to 70 and 80% long-term success rates for people with these conditions. And two weeks later, I was on a plane to my own surprise and also the surprise of any American that I speak to, (laughs) to the northwest of Arkansas in the Midwest. (laughs) And I didn't know it was a state. I didn't know it existed until I went there. And it was the most phenomenal place. It was actually created by a group of South African chiropractors who moved over there about 30-something years ago. And they formulated these techniques specifically to treat complex regional pain syndrome initially, which was basically built around the concept of the vagus nerve and stimulating the vagus nerve as a way to regulate the autonomic nervous system, which is central to these type of central nervous system conditions when the body's just living in a state of fight or flight and stress. And they were taking people that had had this condition for 20 plus years and getting them back out of wheelchairs and walking and running. And I was just observing this like when I was at the clinic myself. So really within the space of three months, I went from not being able to walk to running, jumping, full function back. And I was on my way, sad to leave the northwest of Arkansas. And for anyone who hasn't been there, it's actually a very beautiful part of the world. So I'm a big advocate for it. I'm going to pause you. I have questions. You couldn't walk? When you went there? Yeah, I could walk a couple of minutes at a time. So my life basically oh. consisted it basically consisted of getting an Uber to work, sitting at a desk for 10 hours, getting home, and then going to bed, and I couldn't do anything else. Oh. Yeah. It never spread beyond your legs? Like it's just stayed in the legs? It stayed lower body, yeah. Mm-hmm. And I would consider myself lucky at the moderate end of the scale because there was people that had full body digestive shutdown, people that had been in wheelchairs for a long time. And looking at it now, that was the trajectory that I was on, but luckily caught it at the point where I wasn't quite there. Yeah. And when you were first looking into this, because you said it started with just like what would have been a simple ankle injury, what was the explanation that you got from traditional doctors and people as far as how that developed from just what was an actual injury? 
I think early stages it was largely like, oh, this will resolve itself. This is just some nerve pain that's going to go away after a period of time if you just continue doing what you're doing and say, here, we'll like give you some Lyricar, we'll give you some of these neuropathic pain medication to take the edge off and it'll resolve itself. Then it kind of transitions into, oh, well, there's not much you can really do about nerve pain. So you just got to wait it out and see what happens. I ended up seeing a pain specialist who was quite high level in terms of the modern medicine's understanding of this condition itself. He was a researcher, and but really what it involved was just higher and higher levels of medication and really just throwing a cocktail at it to try and see what's stuck. At the same time, you're getting smashed with all these side effects and not really making progress. So that's kind of all that was yeah. offered in terms of an explanation. Wow. Okay. All right. So then you went to Arkansas and you spent three weeks there. And but within those three months still, you went from barely being able to walk to like running and doing life again. Hmm. What did you guys do there? What do you feel like helped you there at that time? So yeah, as I said, foundational is the vagus nerve stimulation. And it's becoming more known as quite a foundational component for um, a lot of stress-related conditions. Because again, if no one's heard of it, it's basically the longest nerve in the body and it's responsible for controlling inflammation. It links up all of your non-conscious functions like your heart rate and your digestion and all these things within your body. And if it's not functioning properly, it means that you can't get into that rest and digest state where your body has the capacity to recuperate and recover and actually heal. And that's central to what's involved. She, Katinka Vandermeer, who started it, her first patient, all she did was do these manual vagus nerve stimulations over a period of 12 weeks. And she took someone with complex regional pain syndrome and took them to remission. Now, since that point 10 years ago, they added more and more processes and more and more different modalities to the point when I get there, we were doing about seven hours a day, four days a week. And there was about 13 or 14 different modalities that we'd be on rotation. And it was just like this futuristic, holistic wellness center that was a really beautiful environment because they actually got everyone that was healing there, 35 plus different patients from all over the world and all over the States to basically be working together and supporting each other through that process. Wow. We can dive into some of the specifics as well. Yeah. Yeah. I'm so curious. So, but the bulk of it, all those hours, all those days a week, and you said all these modalities, but it was all centered around the vagus nerve. So there was the vagus nerve stimulation was one of the treatments mm -hmm. and it was quite interesting and it was fascinating to me that all of these different conditions from EDS to POTS to fibro to CRPS, among others, neuropathy, that they treated it all the same and they treated it in the sense that the only thing they focused on was basically regulating the central nerve system and bringing mm -hmm. the central nerve system as a whole back into a state of calm because their foundational belief is that the body has a desire and has a constant preference to being in a state of wellness and balance and it's just about removing the blocks to that so if we think about what the different treatments did it was really around removing any blocks to that homeostasis so any chemical blocks via diet and nutrition and supplementation any physical blocks via the rehabilitation and we did a lot of intense stimulation and basically getting everything moving again and then the emotional blocks as well as another component. And when you remove those blocks, it's like you allow the, the nervous system to come back into balance and it does the rest of the work for you. Wow. That's kind of the foundational principle. Wow. Looking back to, do you feel like the fact that you removed yourself from the environment you had been in into this completely new healing environment where that was the primary focus, where it sounds like you had the opportunity to be more relaxed and at ease, do you think that played a role in and of itself? Because they always say, Sometimes we need to remove ourselves from the environment we got sick. Such a good question. I couldn't agree with that more. I think initially it was the hope of being in a new environment, like just and seeing other people that had actually done it. Because with a condition like this, I'd never met anyone else who had had it. I never met anyone else who had gotten better from it. And you get over here and you see people doing it in front of your eyes and being in that environment. If you can get in an environment where there are people doing something similar or have done it or connect with people in that way, it is so, so powerful. And immediately, because I was seeing people that were maybe a month or two ahead that had made great progress, I was seeing people graduating and the transformations that had happened. And the belief factor is, is so crucial because Katinka says that 
the greatest determinant of success or failure is the person's spirit and their determination and from that their belief in the capacity to change so the environment is a really powerful one and I'll speak into that more now as well on how that affected me when I came back from the states because I'd been in this beautiful bubble of healing and transformation for all that time and felt amazing when I left and came back to Australia but then I went back into the old environment where I'd initially created how I perceive it created this condition through my own behaviors and things that we can talk into later but being back in that environment I fell back into the old patterns and I'd felt like I'd fallen behind all my peers and they were all working in corporate jobs they were all studying at a high level and I'd been out of that world and I'm like oh well let's get back into it so I then get caught in that bubble and I enroll in a master's degree. I then start pushing myself to get back to sport so I can kind of feel like I'm normal again. And that was it, the whole thing of like, let me get my life back when I'd had this whole new life in front of me that I could have made whatever I wanted from it. And then it was a matter of like, okay, I hadn't drunk for seven, eight months, but then I felt out of the loop socially because that was the way that I'd connected previously with people. And then I got into that and I started drinking a bit more and I started like socializing. And next minute before I knew it, I'd had a couple of really big nights drinking and doing other substances when I really had no intention of doing so ever again. But it was like the loneliness of being back in that old environment and not having fully transformed my environment back home that I ended up relapsing after and basically just fell into a massive pit. And it all came back, all the pain came back, everything came back online. And it was a really, really low point because I'd blown a lot of money, tens of thousands of dollars of my parents' money on helping me to get over there. And then not being aware of my own behavior and just leading me down the same road that I'd ended up before. And I just couldn't comprehend how that had happened. But looking back now, if we come back to the importance of environment, I just see now like why that's so crucial. Mm -hmm. So hindsight 2020. So I'm interested to know in this moment, you relapse, however you want to call it, the pain comes back, you're feeling all this pain again. At that time, are you thinking, oh my gosh, it didn't work because it's back. I didn't really heal. And did you kind of blame the system to not work because it was back? Or were you at least aware enough to go, oh my gosh, my environment, how I'm behaving, my lifestyle choices are playing a role in this symptom presentation? Yeah, I blame myself. It was just a big pit of shame and guilt, really. And and I just dug myself into that. And there's an element of like, I was taking accountability for my actions, but I was doing it in a way that was just beating myself up to a degree that was making things a whole lot worse than they needed to be. I definitely had the thoughts of like, am I in that small minority of people that this isn't going to work for? Am I that unicorn in this environment? Because you think when you're a chronic pain patient, you're like, you're one of one. And when you have these rare illnesses that you get so used to being the, the medical anomaly that you start thinking that's the case all the time. And then in this instance, it was like, I felt like I was the anomaly that wasn't going to get better from this, even though all these people were. But if we come back to the state that I was in, it's shame and guilt. And this was the really the point where I started to really, really suppress things significantly and the emotional burden started to build up because I didn't feel like I could really explain to my parents what I'd done, my actions. I was too ashamed to say that. And it just created this suppression. And it's almost like a pressure gauge where you're pressing this emotion down over a sustained period of time. And it's just building the pressure in the system. And that's where the suicidal ideation comes in because the self-worth is so low and I was just feeling a really, really dark place, not feeling like I could share it with anyone because I was too ashamed. And that looking back now, it's like, well, that's going to stop you getting better. And it did for a long time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's interesting. I'm glad we even touched on this because so many people, myself included, we do something to help us heal and we experience a ton of relief. And then we go out and we start living life again. And all of a sudden we get new symptoms or old symptoms come back. And I know I did this and I know, and I hear it all the time. It's interesting and great that you didn't do this, but people go, oh my God, that didn't work. Oh, that didn't work. And we blame that therapy, that modality, that tool as the problem. And it didn't work because I'm unwell again, rather than recognizing that 
we perhaps went back and started living the same lifestyle that perhaps like these patterns, these behaviors, these coping mechanisms got us sick to begin with or contributed to us getting sick to begin with. And like, yeah, we did all the tools and lived in this little perfect bubble while we healed. And then when we went back and tried to push to create the same life we used to have, we end up in the same place and we blame the tools. It's good that you were able to reflect inward and notice that your behaviors and actions were part of the reason that you essentially got sick again. But sadly, yeah, you attached with that a load of guilt and shame, which is also not healthy. Yeah, I think it's a double-edged sword in taking accountability because when you initially do it, you feel the burden and the responsibility of having to do something about it or being responsible for it. But it also, once you accept that and you actually start to work with that, it's that's the place of empowerment as well because I'm actually responsible for what I've got here and I have the capability to actually transform. But obviously, you need some tools and you need some information to be able to do that. And that was kind of the next step. Once I accepted responsibility, yes, it was a very heavy time, but then it was like, okay, well, I'm the only one that's capable of really doing something about this. Mm -hmm. But on that point of you mentioning the fact of blaming that something didn't work, and I think, yeah, we're kind of conditioned to believe that there's going to be this golden pill, there's going to be this surgery, there's going to be this one thing that fixes it. But when you think about complex chronic illness, it's like we're talking about a lifetime of different environmental factors, internal factors that build up and build this pressure gauge to get to a point where pathology presents and you have an illness. Now, from from my own experience, it's about stacking and continually evolving and continually adding to your arsenal of tools and skills and knowledge and information to be building upon that. And just because something works at one point doesn't mean that it's not working. It's just that you might need to add something else to break through a new layer and sustain it in a new way. And that's the way I think about it now. It's a constant evolution and an expanding of a knowledge and information base that now that I've built my own up is to impart that on other people through my speaking and sharing that information with others and then also distilling that into practical tools via coaching and being able to help them through their own processes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's such an interesting topic too because so many people have a hard time accepting personal responsibility because they think it means that they have to blame themselves, but it's not about blame, which is important. Okay, so you're feeling all this. Now you kind of feel all the physical pain again and you have emotional pain and you're in a state of distress. Like, Where do you go from there? Down initially to a pretty dark place, but I think I was so blessed. My parents were so supportive through all this. I hear these horror stories of people just not being understood or not being supported in what they did. My parents always did absolutely everything they could. And then at times that was an extremely limited amount based on the fact that they didn't have anything that they could really do. But as soon as these, hmm, I should get a bit emotional thinking about it, but as soon as the opportunity presented for them to get me back there, and, and it was a huge stretch financially for us, but they didn't really think twice about it. I didn't have belief that I was worthy of going back a second time, which is quite a strange thing to say now. But I was in this state where I was like, I don't feel like I'm worthy of the opportunity and I don't feel like what to actually do that. And they basically almost did it behind my back. And at the time I was angry about it, but they ended up dragging me back to the US for want of a better term to actually just get me back into that program and do it all over again. And it was quite bizarre for the second If I think about the first half of that second time I was there, it was a real, real struggle. And my nervous system just kept coming back online and kept firing up and I couldn't get it to calm down. And it was because I was still had these beliefs and this heavy emotional burden and the suppressed guilt and shame of what I'd done that my nervous system was like, no, we're just not in a state to be healing right now. And that was really the pivotal point because I'm like, this worked before why is it not working now? And it took a whole lot of self-reflection for me to then realize what really the problem was. And it reached this point where I still didn't feel really that I'd spoken to anyone about it and I hadn't really opened up. And for me, this is where the vulnerability and the power of vulnerability really got realized for me. And I ended up just calling my dad one day and I was standing next to the phone and it probably took me 20 minutes to actually pick it up because I was just nervous and I called him and I just said dad like I've effed up like I did this I partied I did xyz and I was stupid and it was a really tough conversation but his response after 
what felt like a 25 second pause was it's okay mate everyone stuffs up and I think we suffer so much more in imagination than reality when it comes to these conversations and catastrophizing what's going to be be said the fear of rejection the fear of getting more pain heaped on when really it's the, an alleviation of that burden when you have that conversation and I remember after that I don't think I've ever had a more open and honest conversation with my dad about a whole lot of stuff about a whole lot of things that we were both done in our lives that I wasn't aware of and we ended up having this really amazing conversation and I just felt like the weight had been lifted to a large degree and that was a really pivotal point for me to realize the importance of vulnerability of sharing and of alleviating that emotional burden. Mm, that's awesome. Did you find that the rest of the experience at the clinic went better because of that openness, because that helped you to release the emotions that were holding you back from healing? That was a starting point, but it was the realization and understanding of the power of that mechanism to basically transform and see the power of having the tough conversation, of expressing the emotion, of dealing with it. The next phase of that was really around self-compassion and actually forgiving myself once I'd spoken about it because getting the forgiveness from an external perspective was like very, very powerful. But then it was like, I'm still beating myself up about this. So how do I change that relationship to self? And self-compassion was something that was so foreign to me because I was a real quite a high achiever like I had a corporate job I would studied at a, a good university I'd done well I'd always had that desire but then you get to a point where you've been flogging yourself internally with that dialogue that has actually got you to where you are and who you perceive yourself to be as this high achiever and that critical in a dialogue of do more have more be more and when it, things aren't going well and you're still doing that I was like who am I if I don't do this though this is my personality and then really realizing that these different voices inside of you and understanding what the ego looks like and understanding how to offer the compassion to the parts of yourself that are really struggling and doing more work. I mean, getting introduced to people like the works of Joe Dispenza and these type of things where you start understanding mind-body connection and you start seeing what that looks like and the effect of your own internal dialogue on your physiology. And it was a big, big knowledge I mean, I was just a student of this stuff at the time that I was there because I was there for another four months the second time. And while I was working through my own stuff, building up more knowledge and skills, but this time really around the emotional component and solidifying that. Did they help support you on the emotional aspect of things? Was there that kind of support as well? Yeah, to a degree. They had a few things in place. They had a coach that I worked with who was, he had been through the program it's probably reflecting back and I haven't been there for a number of years, so I can't actually comment too much on what they look like now. But for me, that was the part that I hadn't quite resolved and that wasn't quite fully integrated or supported through that process. And for a lot of people there, like the vast majority of people, they go through that program and they never have a problem again and they live phenomenal lives and they're back doing what they want to do. But for a lot of people, the foundation of what the condition was and how that eventuated was a lifetime's work of different traumas and different emotional conflicts and different behavior patterns that were problematic and a lack of awareness around how we were sort of acting out in our lives. And for me, realizing now that was foundational. And even if I could really regulate my nervous system, get everything back into balance now and do all the work physically, it was still going to throw me out of balance at some point, whether that was through bad behavior or whether that was through the nervous system, just not tolerating the emotion. So that was the realization through that. Interesting. And all that was being realized in those four months while you were there and being supported. Yeah. Yeah. Because I'd, I'd gotten better once with mm -hmm. this framework. So it was like, I know that I can get better and I know it works and I know there's nothing wrong with this program and I know that people are getting really, 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 really well. So it's like, instead of just throwing that out, it's like, well, it's like, yes, and. Yeah. Yes, that works. And what else do I need to do to actually help that work? and if we talk about the environmental factor again, when I came back the second time, it was in the middle of COVID. So <laughs> I live in Australia. So we had to do two weeks of quarantine when I got back from Australia. And if you want an environment that's pretty toxic for being able to get your, your head straight and get back into life, it's two weeks by yourself in a hotel room with no airflow after I'd been at this clinic for all that time. And once I went back into that, 
it was very similar. But this time there was a whole bunch more fear and anxiety that had picked up because of the fact that I'd relapsed the first time. It's the what ifs. What if this happens again? Like I can't go there a third time. Like what's going to happen? And, and that whole thing kicks up and you're in this state of panic. So yeah, that's how I kind of being back in Australia, there was just a whole nother element because my brain was predicting what had happened last time and projecting it onto the future where I was the second time. Wow. Yeah. So how did you navigate that? This is where I first got introduced to more of the emotional clearing techniques. If we think about that model where like 95% of the brain is operating at a subconscious level and we've got that 5% conscious, a lot of the talk therapy and things that I did were, it's a great starting point because it gives you awareness and it gives you an understanding of kind of what's going on. But for me, it didn't really resolve a lot of what was going on. And to do that, We've got to dive under, we're going to go deep, we're going to get into this subconscious and deal with the 95%. That's where the power lies from my perspective. And it was really a process of feeling and learning to feel again because that journey from head to heart, it felt a long way away. I couldn't access, I couldn't feel, I, I just felt it was like this grip strength test that was in my chest. And the more that I would try to resist, the tighter it grabs and the more intense it is. And it's like the trying to resist in trying to resist, it perpetuates. And that the process was really to go in and to be able to get out of my head and just be able to feel the emotions. And the process that I'll take you through at the end of this is basically what I got introduced to. And it's a really simple technique, but it's just about getting out of the analytical and purely into the feeling and the emotion to be able to alleviate that burden. Because all emotion is, is it's just energy. It's just an energetic charge and it's a finite resource. It doesn't last forever, but it just wants to be felt and heard. And once it is felt and heard, then it's going to release itself. And it's really understanding that process where it's like they're not something to be scared of or they're not something to avoid. They're just something to work with because it's part of being human. But if we don't do so in the way that I did and you suppress it down, you get really sick. You get really sick. Mm -hmm. So as you were working through this deeper layer of healing and going into that 95%, the unconscious, was there more that needed to be healed than just the guilt and shame that you were suppressing from relapsing? Did you find that was just like the surface and that actually that was what you became aware of that then helped you to open the door to a lot of other repressed emotions that you were not aware of? Yeah, for sure. And it's layers. It's the Freud quote where it's like, unexpressed emotion never dies. Mm -hmm. It gets buried alive and comes forth later in uglier ways so it's like you can't suppress emotion and just hope that it disappears because it stays inside you and i think that was the realization it was peeling away these layers and understanding like where's this come from where's all this like built up and really working through that and sometimes it's helpful to have understand the story behind it and sometimes it's not even necessary because if you just have the capacity to feel the emotion and clear the emotion you don't actually need to understand the story but I did. I'm obsessive. So I was like searching, searching far and wide to understand what was going on. An interesting one, I actually ended up, I had nothing else to do because I couldn't really work at the time. And I remember I dug up all my granddad's old war memoirs and dusted them off. And they hadn't been touched for 20 years since he was in World War II. And I had nothing else to do. So I just started typing these up, trying to do like 15 minutes a day was about all I could manage. And over a couple of months, I typed up my 75 page document that I then distributed to the family and passed around. But what I realized was like, I was like, why do I do this? Why do I suppress? What's the reason? Why am I like this? Why do I keep stuffing myself up? But it was going back through and hearing about his story and realizing that he had been shipped off to war at the age of 18, which was not too far away from the age I was at the time. And the fact of like, that was him. I'm where I am now. And he didn't really have a choice in that matter. And to survive, you can't express your emotion in that environment. You have to suppress, you have to compartmentalize, you have to put it down. And also within the context of the time as well, you have to be uniform and you have to be the same as everyone else because otherwise you don't survive. And it was just the realizations of these generational patterns that had formed long before I'd come into the picture that had just been passed on through the generations. And that whole like, just push it down and soldier on was a real necessity at the time back then and really functional to actually achieve the motive that they were trying to achieve. But it just hadn't been 
unraveled and it just hadn't been resolved. And I was trying to apply the same principles based on what I was observing, based on whatever had come through in my, from my genetic past as well. And then realizing that, yeah, it's just an outdated approach and we just got to update the software and just update the approach. And this level of self-awareness that was the more that it ascended, the greater capacity I had to then really work through the emotion and understand where it was coming from. So I think it's two things. I think knowledge and understanding is so powerful and so necessary, but it's so is the capacity to actually just feel and process as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So before all of this, would you have thought that you felt your feelings or would you have said you were, really didn't think about your feelings? No, I don't think I would say that. I just think I was very mental. Mm -hmm. I was very focused on achievement, mm -hmm. very focused on doing, very driven, very left brain dominant. And they're all great traits. Like it's a great traits to have and they're, they're just traits. They're not good or bad. But if you're unconscious of them and you don't know why that's happening or how it's happening, then and looking back now, it's really understanding that that intense desire for achievement was driven by an intense sense of or lack of self-worth or a fear of not being good enough that's fueling that. And so you, you're kind of doing it to compensate for a void that's inside and that void gets bigger and bigger and that sense of lack of self-worth and the shame and the not good enough keeps getting bigger and bigger. So I need to achieve higher and higher to be able to feel that. And that was what I was perceived now as happening when I was at university because I was drinking more and more to impress my peers and doing stupid things. And then I was working harder and harder at university and pulling all-nighters as a way to kind of achieve that way. So you need to do more and be more as a way to fill the void that's inside. And that was the thing. I just never felt any of that prior to getting sick. Yeah. Wow. So did you discover all this on your own? Like once you came back from Arkansas, you really learned a lot. Like you had a lot of huge epiphanies. Was this all on your own time, just by yourself doing research? Or did you have support and people kind of helping you and guiding you and coaching you along the way? Yeah, support. Okay. For sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There was a lot I did on my own and I'm a curious person, but it's so powerful to have someone there that's showing you the way. And chiropractors kept coming into my life as the people that have been the most impactful and obviously all the ones in the whole family in Arkansas, but also coming back to Australia, there's a chiropractor by the name of Ian Rufford. I'll give him a shout out. And he basically was really, really transformative for me. He trained in some similar practices in the US with clinic doctors as well. And he taught me this technique called heart speak around the capacity to feel emotion and really dive into that and guided me for the best part of six or eight months, just every week, every couple of weeks, constant check-ins. He was constantly there. I could call him at any time and just be like, I'm at a wall. What do I do? And having someone of that proximity, that access and it was beyond the point of like this clinical setting where I'd go in and get my 15, 20 minutes with him. This is a process. We're going to be working together through all of this. I'm going to be there by your side and showing you. But it's that empowerment piece where it's like, I'm not really doing anything. The tools that I'm giving you are helping, but it's you that is holding the key to this. And I can't drag you across the line, but I can be that personal trainer that's there that's showing you and holding you accountable for you showing up for yourself and putting the work in, but you still have to turn up. And that's the same approach where, that I take with my clients when I'm working with people because it's like I can be there and I can impart my knowledge and my wisdom and, and my support. And as your the name of your podcast says, the power is within because that's where it all comes from and you're still the primary agent in your own transformation. So that was the realization. I took that on when we talk about the accountability piece and the burden of carrying that in a sense or like feeling the weight of it it can be seen in two ways. And I really took that in the other direction when I started to realize that I could actually just be the agent of transformation. And also, I'll add, when we think about having practitioners, it's actually the case of you stepping into your own power by consciously engaging with people that are going to be supportive. It's not that you're abdicating responsibility or leaning on people. It's that you're utilizing their resources and skills in a way that's going to be most beneficial for yourself. You're the primary agent of change and it's like you're the captain of your own ship and all these people around you are crew members that are going to help you and you can try to do it on your own, but it's just going to be a tough, tough slog. And for me, could I have done it without them? Who knows? I don't believe so, but it's a matter of 
getting good people around you and creating and manufacturing an environment for yourself that's beneficial. And that was it for me, like realizing the importance of the environment that we've spoken about in the US and then actually creating something for myself back in Australia to support me. Mm -hmm. How did you encounter him? Because he seems fabulous. (laughs) I've been so blessed with so many amazing practitioners that have come into my sphere. Yeah. I heard about it through one of my mum's friends and she had been seeing him and she'd been hearing about the clinic and she mentioned to him about the fact that I was over there getting this treatment at this clinic and then she said something about the vagus nerve or she'd got treated and he'd treated her vagus nerve and supported her in that and then she'd mentioned that to my mum and then they'd kind of spoken a little bit and he said, oh, yeah, no, I trained with these people like over in the US. Wow. But I live in Newcastle, which is a town of between 500,000 and a million people, it's not massive. And he lived five minutes down the road and it was like just a massive blessing. I'm so grateful to have had that support. And there's been plenty of times where that's come into play. And I guess when I think about what I want to achieve and what I want to try to impart for people through speaking and through advocacy and through sharing information is that that's not an anomaly. You don't need to rely on a fortuitous piece of or spark of inspiration or one-off person. It's like, to actually create and distill and spread this information that I've had the blessing of actually getting to understand and know via all this treatment in America, spending all this money on different modalities and treatments and knowledge so that that's widely known and it's accessible because I would say it's like just because we're in a bubble down under on our island, on our big island down here that we don't have access to the information. But it was bizarre that people in Arkansas itself had the condition for a long time and didn't know about the clinic. The locals in the town had no idea about the clinic. The people in the other states had no idea about the clinic. And because it's outside the traditional sphere and it breaks the paradigm of what people understand to be the medical model or where you go to get resolution for illness, it just doesn't get a run. And that's why I get so fired up and so passionate about spreading my message through the public speaking, getting into more greater audiences, and then also distilling that for people to be able to actually transform themselves. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's so awesome. Okay, so I have to know, how did you end up doing this? Like, how did you go from where you were to public speaking? Like, how did you start getting public speaking gigs and decide this was what you wanted to do? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I feel like if I go back to that time where I'd spoken to dad the first time, and that was really like the first piece of vulnerability or the first piece of expression that I'd had realized, it was like this immediate understanding of like the power of speaking, the power of getting things out and, and actually expressing in that sort of way. And over time, doing that more and more with different practitioners, doing more and more with people that I trusted, having the tough conversation and realizing how healing it is. And yeah, it's uncomfortable, but it's temporary discomfort. And when I compare that to the long-term agony of suppressing and not talking, it becomes quite an easy decision once you realize and you experience that. And that never really stopped. And the more that I spoke and the more that I talked about my stuff, the better I felt. And then it sort of got to the point of like, well, I've got a lot of information that I want to share here and I feel like I've got good impact to be made. And it was a realization that like, oh, like I can create big impact. I started feeling a sense of purpose when I'd speak to people, even if it was just one-to-one people who were going over to the clinic or wanting support through their own processes. And then that basically led me to want to do more of it. And I think if I think about when I started to really actually step into that was probably when I linked in with this organization called Dr. Espen Enterprises, and he would reasonably be considered like the Joe Dispenza of Australia. I mean, what he does, he runs three-day seminars, multiples, hundreds of people. And I attended one of his virtual seminars and we basically, there's like 80 to 100 people on there and we're all running different processes this was where I learned a whole new framework around going back and the timeline therapy and unraveling all these emotional blocks and really working through things in detail. But there was the opportunity to share in that container and understanding the power of that, I put my hand up to share and I spoke about my deepest, darkest in front of 80 to 100 people that I had no idea who they were. And it was such a liberating feeling afterwards. And I was like, wow, that let's do more of that because that's good. So not only did I start doing more speaking, but I also did a lot more work with Dr. Aspen and their organization. And I have been basically for the last year crewing and run, helping facilitate their events alongside him, running the processes in these big group containers, clearing the emotional blocks of people, seeing amazing 
transformations, instantaneous transformations when you do have the capacity to clear emotional blocks, seeing physical illness really, really dissipate in a matter of minutes in certain instances. And it sounds crazy to say that, but you observe the power of it live and it is quite miraculous. So two parts of that, that's where I really developed my coaching methodology and the skills that I apply these days. But it was also the turning point for me to then start talking and expressing and speaking to a much greater audience. That's awesome. That's really cool. So interesting just to see the past, like how they realign sometimes when you find yourself sick. And like you said, you had to go to a really dark place, but you realigned onto this whole new path, which is really awesome. A hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. What does Dr. Esmond say? It's like the pit, turning your pit into your purpose, really. And my company that I've coined it, the Pain to Power Project, on the basis that pain being the greatest motivator that we can have in many instances, it's a greater motivator than pleasure. So when you think about people in chronic pain, they're some of the most motivated and determined people that you can come across. And that's like a privilege to be able to work with because they're going to put in the work. And that's not everyone. Not everyone's in that place to be taking that on, but so many of them have got that power within them that they're ready to transform. And for me, like the biggest sources of pain are the greatest sources of power that you hold. And um, so often that allows you to transform that into something meaningful and some sort of contribution. And I see people from America making the most amazing contributions, having got through their illness because it strips away all the stuff that just doesn't matter. It strips away all the BS and you realize what really matters and you realize what's important. And I'm so grateful for all of it. And that's really the place of healing, arriving at a place of gratitude for all the experiences that have happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's awesome. How beautiful. Okay. So just out of respect for time, do you want to get into the process to share with everyone listening? Let's do it. Okay. So we're going to do a guided process of heart speak. So this is something Ian taught me when I first came back from America and it's the capacity to feel emotions again. So we've got two parts to our brain if we think about the 5% and the 95% and that's the thinking brain and then for simplicity state, the feeling brain, the emotional brain. So if you think about the feel, the thinking is like the, that adult analytical and then the feeling as the child. And so we're going to embody the child and they don't have words, they just have feelings and they just express feelings. So the process basically is we're going to embody an emotion and really feel into an emotion and intensify an emotion and feel the process of actually clearing that out of our system and alleviating that, that energy. So I'll guide you through it, Jasmine. Okay. All right. I'll be there all the way. Yeah, anyone listening, obviously don't be driving. Don't be operating any uh, heavy machinery because okay. it is a deep exercise, but it's also a beautiful exercise and it's will come out of it on the other side. So just close your eyes when you're ready and just bring your attention to your breath. So breathing in and out and in and out. In through the nose and as you breathe out through the mouth, just bring your awareness down to your chest. Just let go of any thoughts that are distracting you. And what we're going to go looking for is the emotion of shame. That feeling of, oh, no, oh, no, I'm a terrible person. Oh, no, I'm not good enough. And if you can even think of a recent memory where you just felt so ashamed or just that intensity of that feeling. And you can bring your head down a little bit Hanging your head in shame. And now feel into the emotion and intensify the emotion as much as you can. Intensify the shame. Oh, no. No, no, no. Let go of the story. 
just focus purely on intensifying the emotion as strong as possible. No, no, no. What's the intensity out of 10 for you, Jasmine? Mm, like a six? Yeah. Beautiful. Stay with it and keep intensifying it as much as you can. Now keep breathing into that, that area in your body where you can feel the shame. Just focus your awareness on it and intensify it. Keep re-triggering it. Stay with it. Keep breathing into that part of your body where you feel the shame. What is it out of 10 now for you, Jasmine? Oh, probably like seven and a half or eight. Okay, stay with it. Keep feeling in and just breathing into it. And it should start to ease a little bit and just keep feeling, letting go of any thoughts. Keep breathing. Keep feeling that energy starting to dissipate. Knowing that you are safe. Knowing that you're held. What's the intensity for you now out of 10? Five. Beautiful. Just stay with it. Keep feeling. Keep feeling into that five. Feeling all of that five. Feel it so you never have to feel it again. Feel it so you can release it. Now keep breathing. How's that now out of 10? It's lower. It almost kind of has transformed into a different emotion. <laughs> Just stay with the shame for now. Okay. okay. <laughs> There's always layers. Just feel that last little bit of shame. Just focus on that. And then breathing into it, just allowing it to be there and just letting go that shame. And now sitting upright, you can put your hands Palms facing up onto your knees. And you want chin back, chest up, and a nice, open, expansive posture. And what you want to feel is a golden glow start to emerge from your chest. Start to pour through your arms, down your body, and the feeling of this golden glow is enough. I am enough. Feeling that all of you is enough. Now breathe in and drink in all of that feeling and intensify that enoughness.
Just hold on to it for a few more seconds and feel all of that. And when you're ready, just letting it go and opening your eyes. Lovely. How do you feel? Good. Yeah. It's fun to observe what happens, you know, like when other emotions or things come up and just notice. Beautiful. Yeah. 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 The reason I love that exercise is its simplicity, but it allows you to very <laughs> oh, I put the host me. to sleep. I put the host to sleep. <laughs> you you made my nervous system relax a little. <laughs> Beautiful. That's the Vegas nerve switching on, yeah. So yeah, I love that exercise because it can sometimes only take a few minutes and you can pivot from a really challenging place of experiencing a really tough emotion if we think about if you're in a real state of shame and whenever I get really you know, I don't like the word triggered so much, but if I do get a bout of shame coming on, then it's I can really just take control and take agency in that situation to be able to transform it and feel it and then pivot to the opposite positive emotion. And you can do that with and what I do with when I utilize these tools with people is you can do it with any emotion. So anger, you can then pivot to a state of joy. And if you're in sadness, you can then pivot to a state of peace. And what you're doing is transmuting. And at the same time that you're feeling good in the now moment, you're also clearing these levels and these blocks that are under there as well. And when I worked with Ian, it was a matter of months and doing that process consistently that you start to peel away the layers and the, the burden on the nervous system starts to ease. And the thing I love about this as well is that you learn these tools and you get taught these tools, but they're tools that you can then implement in your own life and you don't actually need, you're not needing a lifetime prescription of a practitioner to be able to do that. It's about learning it yeah. and becoming it. Yeah. So just to clarify, so we can use that specific tool any time. We don't have to use it just to bring up an old possibly repressed emotion, we can use it in the moment that we're potentially being quote unquote triggered and feeling an emotion rise. So as opposed to doing what I'm really good at, which is saying, feeling like I'm getting angry and then having my like super conscious, like responsible adult self come in and say, oh no, you know, let's just change our perspective. We don't need to be angry. Like maybe it wasn't that big of a deal. Instead of doing that, we actually utilize this process and just like sit with and feel the intensity of that anger. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this one. And I think that, yeah, I'm so good at the emotional bypass as well. I think that's the thing. It's like you feel like you're getting away from it and then you hear it a lot. Oh, I'm not an angry person. It's like, no, you just don't feel anger. Mm -hmm. You are either suppressed it or you repressed it to the point where you're not actually feeling like you're suppressing it, but it's still existing. You know, we're all human. We all experience anger and anger is a good one too. I I had that struggle for a long time and I take it to the next level. I go on rage cage, I yell into a pillow, I yell in the car, I'll go under the ocean and let it all out and it's a very liberating feeling. So you can take it to another level but I think for the context of everyday life, it's great because I can just take five, go into another room, go outside, clear an emotion and then get my head back on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's awesome. That's so beautiful. Thank you for doing that so that people have that. Do you have... Any other final insights or thoughts that you want to share that you feel like would be really pertinent to share today? Yeah, I think that this emotional component that I've touched on, I think is really, really the pivotal piece. And the thing that I focus on when I talk to people, I feel like it's the real foundation of where these chronic illnesses start. And they, they don't start at the point of symptom. It starts at a really, really young age. And what I do with and becoming certified in Dr. Espen's method is is a lot of timeline therapy and moving people back through and identifying the friction points. And when you think about emotions, when they get, I suppose, formulated or the memories get stored, the brain either stores a memory as with a positive charge or a negative charge. So it has that frame. And what we do and what, what I help people with when I go through this process is really to remove that charge, neutralize that charge. So it's not something that's stuck in the nervous system like a splinter getting infected and causing this buildup of emotion toxicity in the system. So I think 
for people, I guess what I would kind of encourage is to keep it really open mind when it comes to these things because on everything that I found that was new and novel and the things that ended up working for me were I was always incredibly skeptical of and I was always like I had that real left brain like I don't understand this so how does this work or like this is just some left field stuff that where someone pulled this from and it was moving past that degree of skepticism that created the greatest points of transformation and for me I think that's sometimes helping people through that and just speaking through my own experience but yeah I suppose for me now it's really two things it's sharing that at a knowledge level and imparting that through my speaking and through my social media and through these type of discussions that I really enjoy and then also distilling that into the practical tools of this is actually how you deal with the emotion and how we best kind of regulate and transform what's been um, built up over a period of time so that would be my primary message to people is keep an open mind and dig back and dive back through your emotions because that's the source of power wonderful thank you and so as far as coaching do you do virtual or just in person right now yeah i do virtual okay i still do these three-day seminars as well with dr espin and we do those as big personal transformation events but i do one-to-ones now as well and help people with these emotional blocks and giving them, empowering them with the tools to be able to heal themselves ultimately because I'm not doing anything other than just providing a framework for them to heal themselves. Yeah, awesome. And how can people get in touch with you on Instagram? So they can find me on Instagram at Harry McCanch. So that's H-A-R-R-Y-M-A-C-A-N-S-H. And as I mentioned at the start, so I put together a free resource that goes over, I suppose, my approach to helping people. And that is how to calm your chronic pain without more medication, even if you've been stuck for years. So if people are interested in that and wanting to understand my framework, then they can send me a DM on Instagram. And if they just say the word within, then I will send that resource across to them and we can have a chat. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here and sharing your wisdom and your story and everything you've gained from it along the way with everyone listening. I'm going to ask you one final question. I used to ask every single person and I've been slacking this year. So I'm going to ask you, and it does not have to pertain to chronic pain or illness or any of that could be absolutely unrelated to everything that we've talked about today. But if you were told that you were only allowed to share one message with the world for the rest of your life, what message would you want to share with the world? Everything good is on the other side of fear. Love it. Yeah. Fantastic. Thanks again, Harry. Thank you so much, Jasmine. It's been great. Appreciate it. That is a wrap. As I mentioned earlier, this very well might be my last interview episode that I share on this podcast. I'll never say never because that's one big, massive lesson I've learned in my lifetime to never say never. But it's feeling pretty settled in my heart at this point. And although I will likely be posting a solo here and there, and like I mentioned earlier, one sooner than later to explain why I'm stepping away, um yeah anyhow thanks for being on this journey with me it's been real there's almost 180 episodes on this podcast with so many amazing epic humans that i got to connect with and talk to and and just pick their brains and there are so many valuable stories and insights shared throughout these episodes. So if you ever find yourself needing a dose of inspiration, you can sit through those old stories because they are just as wonderful today as they were the day they got posted. And there are also are so many other wonderful resources available, both on podcast platforms as well as YouTube. So cheers, my friends. Open wide, the fruitful darkness